Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for your kind introduction. Very glad to be here. I would like to present to you what we have done in this project. It's a joint collaboration between Israel Aerospace Industries, ADE and NAL from India, and also we had uh, the full support of Tel Aviv University. So we're going to discuss in this presentation what are some benefits of structural health monitoring in concept for UAV. We will go over what was the project goals. We will review briefly the advantage of optical fiber break rating uh, sensor. Uh, we will show you how we imply this concept to an Indian, the, the Indian Nishant UAV. We will review the fly data. And finally, we will show you some interesting results obtained during those uh, flight uh, trials. And after some summary remarks, we will give some idea what should be followed. So there is a lot of interest in the UAV community how we should reduce maintenance cost and improve availability of UAVs. A part of it is one key feature that enables such uh, improvement is by the introduction of structural health monitor. The real meaning is that you will do maintenance only upon need. You don't need to inspect periodically your UAV, but you get an early warning in time that something happened and you need to take action. For UAV in general, there are another advantages for SHM since we don't have an un, uh, a pilot which also works as a full-time sensor, get a feeling of the flying vehicle. We don't have it in UAV. So the SHM system can give you an idea of the general vibration, acoustic noise, and all these phenomena that a pilot can sense, and we don't have it uh, built in in the present uh, UAV. Local acceleration coming out of the design envelope is also something that we can track now using an SHM system. And above all, we can track abnormal uh, incident like bird strike, lightning strike, runway debris, and, and so, so those such of uh, event. As a general idea, SHM should provi provide other and additional mean for sustaining the airworthy of uh, UAV. Oh, that's too, that's too, that's surprising. Where am I? Need some help. Need some help. Uh -huh. Okay. Okay, I don't know what happened. Probably I pressed the home button. So what was the project goal? But before I go into details, I want to say it was mentioned here yesterday. At the beginning, there was a DODO meeting with the Israeli Minister of Defense, and I must say that there was more trust in the concept by management than in the technical uh, team. So vision was really uh, came out from DODO, and they were supporting this project uh, very well. So we had a modest uh, goal. We met all of them, and we also uh, finished the program as planned in schedule and also in budget. 
so the main object was to develop a fiber optic based structural health monitor and to demonstrate it as an airworthy system on a real uh, UAV and in this case the Nishant was uh, used as a demonstrator for this uh, concept. Now let's talk about a little bit on the technology. We selected the optical fiber sensor technology and I'll explain in a minute why. Basically, on an optical fiber, you can uh, print a sensor. It's called the brake sensor. It's a periodic corrugation written into the fiber optic and it's used as a strain sensor. Why we go for uh, optical fiber sensors? First of all, the large frequency range. You can measure with optical fiber sensor static strain, acoustic emission, and ultrasound. A wide range of frequencies can be measured by the same sensor high dynamic range. The same accuracy you get when you measure small strain to thousands of microstrains. The most, if not the most important, that you can put as many sensors on a single fiber as you want. So a, a single fiber can sense an entire wing because you can put many, many sensors on this uh, fiber. Uh, UAVs are packed with uh, RF equipment. So we don't want to introduce another source of radiation. Fiber optics are immune to magnetic interface and will not cause any issues and any interface with other uh, RF uh, systems. Fiber optic is very small, very thin. It can easily embed in composite structure. As you know, UAVs are mainly built with composite, so it's an excellent choice. Uh, fiber optic sensor is an excellent choice to be embedded in composite. The large temperature work, uh, temperature working range, uh, it's basically a glass fiber that can resist much, uh, temperature much beyond what is expected from a UAV. It is ro a very robust sensor. It's a major issue here because you need to have a very reliable sensor, much more reliable than the system he is uh, tracking in order to get the required reliability out of an SHM uh, system. It is small, low weight, and not so costly. Actually, uh, in terms of what is expected in the aeronautic industry, the fiber itself is, uh, has a negli negligible uh, cost. Okay, so what is the program uh, structure? First of all, uh, the Indian team, together with us, we defined the system requirements. So the basic requirement was that this system will be a flight-worthy system that will pass all the uh, tests that uh, regular Nishant equipment should pass. And if you see below, uh, we selected the boom as the first candidate to be monitored. We would like to have an autonomous system and also this is a major uh, part of the concept that we would like an independent system that will not rely of getting data out of the UAV itself. It should be operated uh, autonomously. Uh, it should 
sustain the special uh, launch and uh, parachute landing of the Nishan TOV, and we ask for high sampling rate. Actually, we got, we have, the flight test was performed using 2,050 hertz sampling rate, which is above what is usually required, required for aircraft structure. So the main development phases were first routing of the fibers in the boom and from the boom to the payload. Embedding, embedding of the fiber was a major issue. It was done, uh, all of it was done here in India and uh, that issue took us quite a long time to solve. How to integrate those fiber in a real production line of a UAV. Uh, obviously, as I said before, we, had some, we did qualification tests in the equipment level and also uh, integration tests. And we also took care of connectorization issues because the booms should be um, removed from the UAV for transportation or, and we didn't want to change any of the normal procedures used for the Nishan. So uh, we ran for the demonstration and valid verification and validation test. We ran a laboratory test and eventually as the final proof of concept, a flight test was carried out here in Bangalore. So this is the main components of the, of the system. You have here the Nishant UAV. Uh, you see here a close-up of the boom, the boom end, and you see here the optical fibers going up to the wing and from there, there to the payload bay where we had the interrogation unit. And you see here the connectors, as I said, we would like to remove the booms during service and uh, transportation of the UAV. You see here, I hope you can see, you see here the two fibers that were embedded inside the boom while it's being manufactured. This was a very critical stage of the uh, development in order to assure that the fiber will uh, last the, in the manufacturing process, the trimming and assembly uh, of the boom. But you can see here that one of the advantage of using those sensors because we put them inside the boom while it's being manufactured and no additional protection is needed, so the weight increase due to the uh, sensor is negligible. We just have two glass wire, 0.1 of a millimeter in diameter, no change in uh, UAV weight. This is a Again, we're going to discuss the assembly. So the main issue here was to introduce the optical fiber into a real production line boom and uh, to sustain its uh, worthy capabilities. And to have a more real application of an SHA system in the view of that this should be used in a regular UAV in its, or in its native environment uh, condition. You see here that the system structure, you see here the boom, where there were four fibers embedded in each boom. You see here the interrogator. This unit 
unit uh, transfer the optical signals into electrical, uh, uh, to a digital data, which is the, the, the strain, and it was stored in a ruggedized onboard uh, computer. Nowadays, you can get those two components combined together. So actually, we don't need the, uh, a dedicated computer. It's, it's, not, an, it's not, a pro, not an issue to integrate this uh, storage capability into the interrogator unit. But at that time, there was nothing uh, available. We had a remote station, which is simply a PC, uh, that uh, uh, initiate the system, and then you plug it off, and you can fly the UEV. This is a typical outcome of an uh, FBG uh, sensor. You see here that you have, in this particular exam example, you have four peaks. Each peak represents a, a sensor. The sensor reflects uh, light at a specific wavelength, and this wavelength frequency changes in a linear uh, dependency with strain. So, and you can see it, I think, in the next slide. No. So, as you introduce strain, the peaks move to the left or right. And this is also a nice feature of the FB FBG that you track the change of frequencies, not the change in strength of signal. So eventually you get a system with a tremendously good uh, signal to noise ratio that if you remember we would like to measure both crash landing and also 1G level flight. The difference between the reading of those two extreme uh, cases is significant. So the need for a very uh, good sensor with uh, good um, signal to noise ratio is critical to the good performance of such a system. You see here in brief the installation of the system in the UAV in the payload bay. So you have here the onboard computer. Underneath you see the interrogator and you see here the uh, ground uh, station cable. As I said, it was uh, all uh, components were fully qualified according to the Nishan uh, requirement. So the FBG interrogator and also the onboard uh, PC uh, successfully passed shock and random vibration test. Uh, also, we performed a temperature cycle test and a special care was given to the uh, optical uh, connectors, and they also were found to be adequate for, uh, to be used for this project. Oh, here, here you are. Uh, we, you see here an example of two tests and the effect of mechanical loading on the FBG readings. So as you see here, there is there is a change of wavelength caused by the introducing of external strain. And you see here that the peak moves in the, and quite uh, high, at quite high uh, strain. And you see there's uh, almost no distortion in the peak shape, so it came out to be a very uh, accurate uh, strain measurement, and I should point out 
that all those tests were performed on an embedded sensor. So the effect of uh, embedding in the composite structure was considered in those is included in those tests too. So we have a static test, and since we have an interrogation unit that uh, its sample rate is very high, we could also track some dynamics uh, phenomena, which uh, that was also not a big uh, issue. Uh, we introduce the optical fiber into the boom based on a detailed finite element performed here in Bangalore. So you see here, it's quite nice example of an optimal uh, design of a boom where you have almost constant strain along uh, the boom, though the loads uh, vary from section to section, but the change in thickness and plyo and tension gives us this uh, neat uh, design tailored to uh, the uh, boom uh, requirements. So what was the idea in, in selecting the sensor placement? So you see here, a typical section uh, of the boom. So we had, as I said, four fibers embedded in each uh, boom. We had two fibers exactly at the vertical center line and two off-center off fibers. This arrangement allows us very easy to separate the strain induced by the vertical bend, uh, bending when you're supposed to have similar strain on the two top fiber and opposite strain on the uh, bottom fibers. That's for the vertical bending. And for the side bending, the middle fibers actually supposed to see nothing because they are on the neutral axis. So by this special arrangement, where at each section that was under investigation, we had four sensors, we can easily separate the vertical bending and the lateral bending by the nature and the, and the proper selection of sensor location. Uh, this is more or less what is being said here. Mm, nothing to add, I guess. And you have here the first step of the calibration and qualification uh, of the system. So you see here a boom on a shaker where we could measure its dynamic characteristics. And you see here uh, the Nishant UAV uh, equipped with the airworthy uh, booms, and we made an engine run test to see the, to check the integration of the system into the UAV and to check whether we have some interference between the system. As you can see, this was done here uh, in India in Bangalore. So this is an example of measurement taken during this engine run test. You see here power spectral density analysis of FBG readings for a specific engine RPM. You have here the 5,000 uh, RPM, 6,000, and 7,000. And you, see, uh, and you see the results. So we could clearly identify some frequencies that were associated to the structure and they were not affected by the engine RPM. And some frequencies are with a linear relation with the engine RPM. So this is uh, also a type of information that c 
can be used for structural health monitor of the entire system because what the boom feels, it's actually a transfer function from the engine to uh, the boom. So if you take this picture and you track its evaluation over time, you might see if you get some changes, and those changes might be associated to some damage that may uh, occur. So it's not just that we take advantage of the high frequency sample of the system. You can get much more than just the strain in the boom. You get some understanding of the general behavior of the entire vehicle. This is the full record of the two hours flight. And you see here, this is for two, for two sensors at the same station of the boom, where you see here engine start, takeoff, uh, some turns, and at the end, uh, the parachute landing. So again here you can see that during level flight, you have small, uh, small changes in strain that we can easily track, but we also can track the high strain uh, introduced during the landing. Uh, again, here's a close-up view of uh, take, uh, during takeoff. And you see since we have a, strain, a sensor top of bottom of the boom, they should uh, respond in a 180 degree uh, phase. And we see here that the, the I, they're out of phase, and you can see this all over the entire uh, flight, and this is expected. No, that's, sorry. Okay, uh, that's because I'm uh, pressing the end. I'm almost done, I'm almost there, but not yet. No, let's do uh, uh, just let's go to slideshow and we will skip it slowly. Oh, no, 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 no. No, no, that's okay. No problem. Apologize. That's okay. Full screen. Okay, so how we handle the data we got from this uh, flight test. This is an important uh, issue. You get huge amount of data. In our relatively simple case, we had uh, eight, no, we had 16 sensors eight on each uh, boom. This by itself gave us six gigabyte of data. So you need to have some algorithm to reduce the size of the problem. And this is uh, what you do. We, you have, you see here, a typical uh, full data of uh, left-hand side boom during uh, landing. So first of all, based on ground calibration, we normalized all FBG sensors since basically what we see in this test that you have a first mode uh, motion. So all sensors are in phase. And uh, we normalized and then we check the cross correlation between the uh, sensor, and I'll explain. So this is the original data. No, this is the original data, and here it the same. Uh, you see the same data after it's being normalized. So you see from eight 
sensor, we get almost a straight line, and we need to discuss what is going here. And it's quite obvious that something is different here. You see here, all sensors are identically uh, on top of each other because of the normalization process. So we take this da data and we plot all data from the eight for seven sensor in respect to a single sensor. So you get here the seven sensor and this is a single sensor. You can select any sensor that you want. And you see if it's a normal behavior, they should be they should all fall on a 45 degree uh, line, except for a single sensor that came out of this uh, f uh, general uh, trend. And this is an indication that something happened in the boom during flight. And by the way, if you get a new point somewhere here, that's an overload. If you get a point here, that's uh, something changes. Uh, this sensor is behaving not as expected. And we go back to look at the normalized data, and we see here that we got some local buckling. It's a safe phenomena. It just indicates you that the boom is with no uh, excessive uh, margin. It's well uh, designed. And you get a local buckling. This local buckling occurred here. But since afterwards, this same sensor behave as it is expected, we can uh, detect, we can see that no permanent damage occurred to the structure. So we have both diagnostic and prognostics based on this algorithm. Summary. So we managed to produce a flight worthy system that was successfully tested on the Nishan UAV. All major flight events were clearly detected. Uh, the flight worthy system withstood all, may, all flight conditions, including 9G launch, flight maneuvers, and uh, landing. And we could come out with algorithm that can help in uh, diagnostic and prognostic the structural integrity. Two, two more slides. Meanwhile, we uh, in Israel in be, uh, went ahead with a similar system that was placed on an AH uh, American helicopter. Here we track a crack that is somewhere uh, near the, the tail, and this system is being flying for nearly three years, and we keep tracking this uh, repair, and we monitor the crack growth uh, quite successfully. Mm. What next? This is my last uh, slide. What should we, uh, where should we go? in terms of technology. Uh, we feel that optical fiber sensing is of a came of age and it's mature. A new emerging technology of sensing based on the communication industry came recently uh, and they are available like continuous sensing when you, you, you take the bare fiber and embed it and you use a Rayleigh backscatter 
reflection to measure strain, and many other uh, sensing constant based on optical fiber sensor. Embedding, embedding should be improved. It's not easy to do this embedded process that I described uh, earlier. And of course, prognostics and, uh, and algorithms in order to really evaluate and to detect problems in uh, a robust way without false alarms. Uh, we should come out with a low weight. So we, are, we are there and uh, at, expect, at acceptable cost. Nowadays, I think it's reasonable, even now. And if we succeed, we can then, there's a wide range of opportunity in introducing those SHM capability into the design uh, criteria in order to have a lighter and more cost-effective UAVs. Thank you very much. Any questions? I am Kishore from Gas Turbine Research Establishment. I'm, uh, are these fiber optic uh, sensors commercially available for uh, gas turbine health monitoring applications? Yeah, no problem to get them. They like are available I, commercially. Like I read somewhere, like uh, they are used for measuring uh, temperatures and pressures. Yeah. Like yeah. Uh, to what kind of, uh, to what extent of uh, operating environment, like what is the maximum temperature range? Uh, Hundreds. It's in the 100, 300, 400, not a big issue. As long as you have uh, the right coating, we use polyimide coating, which can sustain up to 300 degrees. Up to now, 300 Much degrees. more than common uh, epoxies used for UVs. All right, 300 degrees Celsius? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. One more question, you can take this last. Hello? Can detect? Yes? Yeah? First of all, I think we should be very happy that we can track damages. Now, uh, obviously, if it's an uh, impact caused by a runway debris or uh, uncareful uh, uh, officer that was by mistake uh, hitting the boom, obviously we can't tell. But the main idea is to track damages. The real challenge is after you know the damage, whether you can calculate the remaining life of the structure. That's not easy for composites. But the main issue is to find the damage, to assess its severity, and come out to a decision whether it should be repaired immediately or you, or you, can, you may fly it for a certain uh, period of time until you repair it. I think uh, Morning, we sir. can have more questions probably during the break. We're running short of time. One yeah. question. PZT, for example? Yes, but we select, yes, but we, are, we, are, we had to make a decision where we, sh we, we see all, uh, many people are working with PZT, PZT, but we thought, and I still think, that since P 
PZT requires electricity and it's so sensitive to strain, it will not, it's not so easy to bond. I think in terms of reliability, reliability of the sensor itself, the optical fiber technique is uncompetable. And, and the cost. And the cost. I think we'll have rest of the questions during the break. Uh, and I take the opportunity to thank uh, uh, Dr. Rido Krithal for his excellent talk on uh, structure health monitoring and this why it's critical in uh, most of the measurements. Uh, thank you.